uh, I went to his Facebook page and posted on his wall saying he's welcome to come and he could message me and I give him the details. So that would be, you know, how awesome would that be, you know? I figured there is a, a virtually non-existent chance of it, but it'd really be annoyed. I, I would really be annoyed if like the next day in the paper I heard, you know, him say, you know, I'm really interested in what community colleges are doing as far as mobile software development. <laughs> <laughs> and he was here. <laughs> Don't you ever read Facebook. Him, you know? so, and the implication of that is that really has no impact for us. The classes that run between noon and four on Wednesday are canceled. So if you have any classes, oh, pardon me? All classes. all classes, period. Yeah. Between noon and four are, are canceled. So uh, I, I have a class in that time frame. I don't, I don't know if any of you do or not. Don't ask me what happens if you like have one that starts at 11 and goes to one. I don't know if like the lab will be canceled. I don't know. But um, you know he's supposed to be here at 2:30 ish or so. So he'll be he'll be out uh, in you know uh, before uh, that goes. We do have our mobile software. Um, seminar, I guess you call it, or presentation that evening at 6 o'clock, and, and you're welcome or, or even encouraged to attend, and then we'll have regular class here. All right, our, our bigger topic has been on deployment, and um, we talked a little bit about applets last time. I want to go back and take a look at applets. In a nutshell, an applet is a Java mini application, if you will, you know, hence the, hence the term applet, um, that runs within um, a browser, runs within a web browser. And I, if I did not keep it, I, I'm sure I have, I'll, I can download it again. I, by the way, I did uh, forget to enable some of these applications, uh, or examples rather. Uh, so if you try looking for them, a student pointed out that I, um, that you weren't able to, to uh, download them, but, but uh, I did now. Here's the applet example, and we'll pull it down, just to give you a sense of what it is. For all these, I used the um, weather, um, or the, the temperature conversion. And so the applet looks like this. If we go and we double click on our web page, we notice a few things happening. Um, whoops. Update plugins. Details. <laughs> if I can open it in the IE less. Difficulty with less difficulty. All right, there we go. All right, and there we go. Up pops our little application which we've seen before, but now it's an app. Now it runs in a web browser. In other words, the implication of this is this is a different way to deploy this application, right? Um, we, we saw last time, I, I think it was last time, me creating a jar file that could be sent and could be included in, as part of an install script to, to go and install it onto a client machine. But this doesn't require it to be installed in advance. You download it from the web server as you request it. So you, know, you should have always the new version of it. And you can go and run it. And it works. And it runs within your web browser. I, uh, I looked a little, I actually looked into it because I had some questions about saving. It is possible to save an applet, but one of the security things with uh, applets is that um, it can't write to your local machine. You know, the people that develop this kind of realize, gee, you open up a can of worms if you allow to do that. You know, that would be a, a no-brainer way to expose machines to viruses and, and such. Um, I do understand that there has been security breaches within Java that have allowed people to do malicious things, but that's not part of the design. Um, but anyhow, yeah, so as a rule, yeah, it will be downloaded. We looked a little bit at, at this, and um, again, to look at the HTML tag, 
or the, the HTML page is really just a simple applet tag. Oops. That simply has the name of the class that we want to run on the server. All right. This again relates to the web server that this applet lives on. In this, in this example, you know, I'm just opening up the file, but if this were on a web server, it would look the same thing. Uh, what this is saying is that there's a file called firstgui.class on the web server. It will be downloaded, it will be run, and there's some parameters for it. The text in the applet tag is the text that will display if the, you don't have uh, Java set up and enabled. All right. We looked at the actual Java code for this, and really there is a huge difference between uh, code for a Java application and code for a Java applet. Um, they're just um, the, the main uh, method which typically would exist in a Java application is replaced by an init method, in effect. We'll take a look at some of the other methods that you have as well. All right. So really, to take an application and turn it into uh, a Java applet, a lot of times will be as simple as changing the main to a, a net and maybe, oh, and then and changing um, the class instead of uh, 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 extending the, the J frame, it extends J applet. And then maybe, like for example, there's a couple things on the J applet you can't do that you can do to a J frame. For example, default close uh, operation. I have some resources in Angel that we're going we're gonna to take a look at that talk about some of the other events that you have available to you in Java applets. I could just see that though, you know. Are there any questions? I mean, look, you see President Obama had his hand raised in the back, and it's like, why did you decide to have two Android and only one iOS class in the mobile program? It's like, wow, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah, under resources. Here's a nice resource about getting started with applets. It kind of summarizes um, these things. Does the little hello world applet. Let's see if there's anything meaningful in here. Talks about the init method. Init method used for one time initialization that doesn't take very long. The init method typically contains the code that you would normally put in the constructor. The start method contains code that executes after the initialization. Stop method and destroy method are kind of corresponding, going the other way when the application is, is on its way out. See if there's anything else. It requires you having a Java plugin. Um, there's a little bit about sort of the architecture of it a Java plugin which starts threads on the Java virtual machine. And I want to look at any security implications. I think this document contains those. You can also use a jar. I think I um, yeah, I think you can. I might be thinking of a, of a different document. Um, this one is one I just uh, put up now, a comparison between uh, Java applets, Java applications, 
and something that we're going to talk about a little bit later on, which is the reason um, that I have, uh, have my laptop here. Actually, maybe this is the exact same thing. I posted it twice. This is. Wow. Funny. I don't, get, I don't get what it's doing. It's displaying my page and it disappears for a second. Or longer than a second. Let's try accessing it another way. Wow, this is really annoying. I'll tell you what, we'll see. Actually, I know what I'll do. I think I know what I'll do. We'll go to the cache version. <laughs> That's it, I, I quit, I'm going home. <laughs> All right, hopefully it will come back. I'll try again later um, on this. It, I, I swear, I brought it up just as I was waiting for the class uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to start. Um, oh, you know what? What browser was I trying that on? Tried an IE. I just tried it in. All right. Just doesn't like Firefox. All right, here is a, a nice little chart that compares um, them, I think. Can scroll down here. Yeah, here we go. Um, it indicates that uh, a, a applet requires a browser. Java Web Start does not require a browser. You typically use a browser to, to like download it and fire it up, but you can actually run it disassociated from a browser. It doesn't run inside a browser. Must wait for download every time. That was kind of the question you had. An applet's yes. A JWS or an application, no. All right. How to install. All right. Again. The whole idea of this in talking about the different alternatives is, is to talk about how easy deployment is. In this case, there is something that you have to do to deploy it, right? You have to click on it and you have to do that. And you have to make sure that um, you have Java installed on a machine and in, in browser, all right, for, for uh, a client. All right. And there's a little bit of requirements with uh, Java Web Start as well. 
that the MIME type be set in the browser and um, you have JRE installed. Again, um, these are sort of uh, minimal requirements on the machine as compared to installing it. Not necessarily the requirements, but the resources in, in involved. All right. And there's a few other things listed here, what you need to do on a server, on, on the server and, and client and so on. So I'd urge you to, uh, to uh, review this. But apparently, you need to use uh, Internet Explorer to view this. Or at least you, on this machine, you'd have to use Internet Explorer. There's one thing I wanted to talk about, signed. Um, applets, to do anything interesting, it needs to be uh, digitally signed. Um, Java Web Start usually are digitally signed in applications. That's not really relevant for you. That's just sort of a, a way of, uh, you know, uh, allowing you to confirm, um, you know, the creator of it and that, in fact, you do want to run it and so on. Without that, again, Java applets really have uh, limitations about the stuff that, that you can do. All right. So, remember, these are in that middle category of stuff that you have some requirements on the client, but not necessarily extensive ones. A browser and the Java runtime engine. But you don't have to go and actually go and install it on your machine. All right. Therefore, uh, the deployment issue is simplified because in, in the case of an applet, anyhow, you're always downloading and installing the code every time you run it. Questions about this? I kind of got distracted not loading that page. I kind of lost my train of thought. I, I, hope, uh, I hope I recovered it enough uh, to make sense uh, to you. Let's look at the other option, Java Web Start. And for Java Web Start, I need a web server that is configured to accept Java Web Start. And that's why I brought this here. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you how it works. It's nothing earth shattering. Let's see if I can do this easily. Oh, this isn't so bad. If you notice, there's a link to launch app. When I click on it, notice what happens. It's downloading a file. And eventually, up will pop up the Java virtual machine. There it goes. There's my machine showing all that. And there's my application. So notice that does not run within a browser. All right. That is outside of a browser. And I can go and double click that and click convert and it does its thing. So it looks kind of like an application, but it was launched from the web browser, hence the term Java Web Start. Now, as was stated, I don't absolutely have to have a browser. Once I've downloaded it, I can go in and There's that file it downloaded, the conv.jnlp. And if I double click on it, there's my application again. So I download it and deployed it from the browser, but you actually don't even have to have the browser open to run. All right. OK. How do we make this work? I've downloaded, or I, I posted the code to Angel. Let's go and grab it and we can look at it.
download the JWS application. All right. And if you look, we have three pieces to this. We have our jar file, which I created. Again, it's the same jar I created a couple times ago. All right. Or very similar to it, if not exactly the same. I have a web page again, and I have that JNLP file that actually gets um, that actually gets um, downloaded to the client machine. Let the, the jar. There's nothing really to see there. We've covered those. Let's look at the contents of that JNLP file, and I'll bring it up in Notepad. If we look, it's an XML file. Um, how familiar is anyone with XML? A little bit, somewhat. Uh, XML, in a nutshell, is, is a format for, uh, it's really a language to describe formats for um, expressing data and expressing a structure of data. Um, XML really itself is, is sort of a language that you can use to define other languages. In other words, you define what is going to be in uh, a JNLP, and then you follow the rules of XML. And some of the rules of XML are that every uh, XML file has a, has a root node. All right. In other words, notice this JNLP tag, there's only one of them. Right? So that's considered to be the root node. It's like a tree. All right. Um, you can define what tags are allowable, what tags mean, and so on and so forth. So in this example, the JNLP is defined using that format, and it contains information about the applet, or, or I'm sorry, application that we're going to load and run whenever we run this file. Now again, my browser was set up, at least on this machine, to know what to do with JNLP. If your browser doesn't know what to do with it, then it won't be able to run it, which I suspect is a problem on this machine. Um, we give the specification. We say where the code is located. All right. This is actually the name of the web server on my laptop. Localhost tilde Mike Zeller slash JWS. So what that refers to is that refers to the folder on this machine, on this machine's web server to be more precise, where this code lives. All right. So normally that would be your domain, but again, this is uh, th this is is again taking these files from this machine, so it uses the the URL associated with that, and it specifies that the JNLP file is called conv.jnlp. You know, it gives the name of the file. Here's some information about it. All right what the name of the uh, application is, who the vendor is, the description of it, where the home page is for this application, a short description, anything that you want to put in, and the fact that I can run this offline. That's what allowed me to go and double click on it and, and run it on this machine. I then specify the resources that I want. All right. I specify that it is going to get the, H, uh, the uh, jar file from this location. Now again, since the code base is this, my file would actually be in localhost slash tilde Mike Zeller slash JWS slash conv.jar. So this is like the directory that's going to find the code. This is actually the jar file for the code. A little bit about the version I'm going to run in. And then finally, there is something that explains where it's going to find the main class. All right? And where is it going to find the main class? This is very similar to what we put in our manifest, right? We specified it's going to find it in this class. All right? Using all the packages that go down uh, in it. So it's going to find this class in this jar and run its main method. All right? So that, in a nutshell, is how you set up that J, JNLP file. Uh, you give parameters that get downloaded. And again, if your browser is correctly configured, your, your browser knows what to do with these files. That is, knows that it opens it up with the Java runtime engine. And then based on these parameters, it finds out on the web or wherever. In this case, it wasn't on the web. It was on my local machine, my local machine's web server. 
and it downloads that code and runs it. I believe there's parameters in here where you can specify how often to look for a new version of it. I believe. In other words, you don't always have to look uh, in it. I haven't played too much with the parameters in this, just enough to get it going. So I believe there's other parameters in here as well. Now let's, let's quickly look to see if we can find any. They have icons that can be related to it. They have security that it's going to be asking for, and so on. So there's other things other than the ones that I put in. Each application is by default run in a uh, restricted environment, similar to the applet sandbox. In other words, there's no difference in the uh, permissions that the applet had than my JNLP because I didn't ask for more security. If I, if I uh, change that, if I give all permissions, uh, then uh, the jar would need to be signed and the user will be prompted to accept the, the, uh, the, the certificate. And so on down the line. I thought there was something in here with how often it would check for a new copy, but I'm not seeing it. I could very well be mistaken. All right. Now, a couple of things we need to look at. We need to look at the web page that that contains. And in this case, the web page is very simple. It simply contains a link to <coughs> that JNLP file. And again, it's simply a href equals and then the name of the JNLP file. And again, if the web server knows how to serve these up, and the browser knows how to deal with them, then the magic happens, right? If either of those two things aren't configured properly, if the web server doesn't know how to serve these guys up, in other words, if the mind types aren't set, or if the browser doesn't know what to do with them, if either of those things are the case, then it's not, it's not going to work. Um, here's a bit of a uh, description of how to set the MIME type for JNLP. And this is something that you do on the server. This is simply letting the web server know that how to properly send a JNLP file to the client, how to properly identify that that's what a JNLP file is. All right. So let's sum up where we've been so far and let's look ahead to uh, our next steps. We talked, when we first started talking about deployment, we talked about there being, in, in very broad terms, three possibilities. The one possibility being that the application was installed on the client and everything about the application lives on the client and it's a you know, standalone on the client. Um, that is much like, you know, you know, I guess I'd call that sort of the traditional way of deployment. You know, you give someone a CD uh, or, or you download the file, you install it on your machine, and it's on your machine. Whether you're disconnected to the network or connected to the network or whatever, uh, it's on your machine. It's possible to require some network resources, but again, you know, if you think of Word or other applications, for the most part, um, they're running on, on your machine sort of standalone. The, the edge that we haven't talked about yet, which is our next topic, is where there virtually is nothing on the client. So we have everything on the client, we have nothing on the client. 
We have explored the middle ground, and the middle ground consists of applets and Java Web Start. Um, sort of the short uh, description of them is a applet has to be written as an applet. All right, an applet runs in a browser. All right, and an applet, generally speaking, has pretty severe security restrictions on it. Java Web Start is possible to, through digital signing and, and configuring your JNLP file, to request for more permissions that will allow you to do more stuff. All right. Both of them are launched via a browser. Uh, the JNLP doesn't require you to have a browser open. It will, it will run the application in a window by itself just like a regular application. It just gets deployed uh, a different way. Again, both of them will typically have a web page that will either have the applet embedded in it or will have a link to, to fire off and start up the, the Java Web Start. With Java Web Start, again, there's really no conversion involved. You don't have to convert an application to Java Web Start like you'd have to convert an application to, to be an applet. But both of those, again, are sort of in the middle ground. All right, let's put back up our chart here. Don't take the words all literally, <laughs> all right? Nearly all might be a better way to say it. The all client is where you install an application. The mix where there's a bit coming from the server, a bit coming from the client, is either the applet or the JWS. Again, there's that good chart in, the, in, uh, in Angel that, that uh, highlights the differences and so on. In this case, you need the JRE. And you need to have installed the program. In this case, it's deployed over the web. That's a big win, a big simplification. But you also need the JRE. So you might, again, this gets rid of the problem of deployment, but it doesn't get rid of the problem that the client has to have the JRE installed. All right. The all server would be servlets and JSP pages. All right. And this has no requirements on the client other than you have a browser. All the action takes place on the server side. And what gets delivered to the client is simply what always gets delivered to web clients, and that is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The standard, the web standard languages. Well, if the client doesn't do any work, who has to do the work? I guess the server does then. So the server then is responsible for um, executing the Java code and the Java uh, uh, programs. And these programs are, again, identified. There, there's two slightly different variations uh, of these. There are servlets, and they are JSP pages. Now, the interesting thing is, is that a servlet and a JSP page, when it gets compiled, they sort of end up being the same. All right? They sort of get compiled, and effectively, there aren't huge differences between the two. Probably a good way to think of these two is that a servlet is a Java class that outputs HTML. All right. Whereas a JSP page 
is a web page that contains Java code that is executed on the server side. So, is there HTML in your Java or Java in your HTML? You know, more or less. You know, and that's why ultimately, you know, when the day is done, uh, when things are compiled, there really isn't a huge difference between the two because they're both doing the same thing. They're both mix, mixing HTML and and server side Java code. Let's talk a little bit about server side scripting in general before we talk about the specifics uh, of the Java implementation of this. All right. Um, I am thinking most of you, have, have you all had the uh, intro to web development class? I would say I think Patrick is the only one that might not have. All right. Yeah, you're, you're taking it now and I know you're taking it now and I know you've had it in the past. Um, you're, have you done any web development in HTML? Okay. Um, in, in HTML, in, in web development, generally speaking, there's two sorts of pages, two, two general kinds of pages. There's static pages and there's dynamic pages. A static page is a page that doesn't change unless there's human intervention. All right? That'd be an HTML document. For example, here is a page that I've used in, um, in my HTML class. These are all origami made that you can't see. No wonder I didn't hear the oohs and ahs. All right, you still can't see it very well. This is a static page. In other words, it has these four images on it. When I showed my class this, all right, it looked exactly like this. It doesn't change. Why? Because the code is just in plain old HTML. And HTML by itself is static which means it's exactly going to work like that. In other words, we come back on Wednesday and look at it, it's going to look exactly like this. doesn't matter what we do, it's going to look like this. It's static, it's not changing. The only way it changes is through a person going in and making a change, through human intervention. All right? Consider, and that's how the first web pages were created, and that's, that's how the web evolved and so on. You know, because back then, just doing that was a big deal. Right? Just being able to link documents together was like amazing and revolutionary. All right? uh, but if you think about most sites today, most sites today really aren't static. Most sites today are dynamic. What do I mean by that? I mean by if I go to Google and I search for Java servlet, I get my results. Now, did it have a page out there waiting for me, anticipating, gee, he might be searching? No, of course not. It made this on the fly. It took my parameters and plugged it into some program somewhere. And that program outputted an HTML page. See, browsers get HTML. When the day is done, whatever happens on the server side, it better be delivering HTML. All right, because that's what browsers know. That's what browsers get. All right. Likewise, if I go to eBay and I search for what do we want to buy? Cleveland Indian World Series program. You know they're going to cost a lot of money because they're so old, <laughs> right? Now, if I look at this, there's 13 bids on this, and the, the current top bid is, is uh, $37, all right? If I were just to go and click Refresh, it's possible that someone in the meantime has bid, right? And if I had $38, I would go in and bid to demonstrate, all right? 
but I don't, so we can use our imagination. So let's say someone goes in and bids $38 for this. Well, the number of bids will change from 13 to 14. The price will change to $38, and the time's going to change, because there's no longer two days, 13 hours, 27 minutes left. There's a different amount of time left. In fact, if I hit refresh a couple times, all right. See, that changed to 26 minutes. Now, think about it and, you know, and apply some common sense, you know. Is there a web developer sitting in, in, in eBay headquarters watching the clock? Oh, 26 minutes left now. I better edit that web page. Of course not. So how does it work? It works through server-side scripting where there are programs that create web pages. So it's kind of we've, we've moved up a step uh, on a level. No longer are we making web pages. We're writing programs that make web pages. And when you take that approach, you can make the pages dynamic. That is, you can make them change over time. You can make them change based on the contents of a database. You make, can make them ch uh, change based on communicating with other resources, uh, and so on. And that's really what made the web what it is now, is, is all those things. Because static pages, as good as they are, are just limited to like electronic brochures. But when you add this dynamic capacity to it, really what you have is you have an application that happens to live on the web. All right? Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, you know. But it's different than an encyclopedia because it can change. As new things happen, stuff can be put in. It's dynamic. It's changeable. And that's what really gives the web power. Well, if I'm going to draw a diagram, it would look like this. I am my client connected to the internet, connected to a web server, and in the case of static pages, The web server's job is easy. You ask for a page, it finds a page, and sends it back to the client. That's all it does. Oh, you want the page about origami? Okay, here it is. Boom. There you go. With dynamic web pages, though, instead of having a completed HTML page, you have a recipe for an HTML page. You have what generally are called server-side scripts. Now these server-side scripts are not written in HTML. These server-side scripts could be written in PHP. They could be written in ASP.NET. They could be written in Perl. They could be written in any number of languages or they could be JSP pages or Java servlets. And what, they, what happens when one of these pages are requested is the web server goes and does its thing, but it, isn't, it can't simply take the completed web page and deliver it. It has to bring it to life. It has to on the fly create that web page using the script using the database, and maybe even using the user input. Right? If you remember on Google, it brought up Java servlet search results because that's what I typed in. I typed something else in, it's going to bring up a different set of results. So, instead of static web pages, which are already finished HTML that just need to be delivered to the client, in the server-side script for dynamic pages, you have code, you have a program that takes the user input, the database, and maybe other sources of data, does all the cool programming things that we've done all along, all right, looks at the current time, looks at the time that the auction expires and calculates how much time is left goes out to the database and sees what the highest bid is, goes out to the database and counts how many bids there are, does all those sorts of things, processes it, and creates an HTML page. So these programs, the output of these programs is an HTML page. All right. 
So, Java servlets and JSP create that HTML page using slightly different techniques. A Java servlet is a Java class whose output is HTML. In other words, instead of system.out.println, there are other commands that say, hey, I'm going to send some HTML. And JSP pages are regular web pages that have some Java embedded within them to do sort of the dynamic stuff. What we'll do next time is we'll look at the details of these two. And we'll look at some examples of what a JSP page will look like, what a Java servlet will look like. Now, remember though, with these, these are completely server-based solutions. Which means that all this stuff happens on the server. So there's no deployment issue. Right? Every time the browser requests a page, it's getting a freshly baked web page from the server. All right? Made just at that point in time. The browser doesn't even need Java on it. The browser just needs to understand browser stuff, HTML. Why? Because the server's job is to execute those programs and create HTML to present the stuff to the user. So it's an important thing to remember that in this scenario, the, there's minimal browser or there's minimal um, client requirements, right? All you need is a browser that understands HTML. So you know you start thinking about putting things mobile-wise or on varying devices. Gee, I don't have to worry about can the iPad run Java, <laughs> all right? Because the iPad don't have to run Java. The iPad just needs to understand HTML. And if you have an electronic device, you know, uh, a mobile device or whatever, that doesn't understand HTML, well, then sort of all bets are off in this, in this, uh, uh, in this discussion, right? Any kind of mobile device, laptop, whatever, is going to know HTML. All right. Maybe your microwave doesn't know it, but everything else will. All right, questions. That's what we'll pick up on Wednesday, looking at some more specifics of a servlet versus um, JSP pages.